Revelation fits with all of Scripture. You know, what Peter says in 1 Peter 5, the devil walks about as a roaring lion. Resist him. I think that's what Revelation is saying in conquering. Resist. Resist the dragon. Resist the two beasts. Resist the prostitute Babylon. They're pressing on you. They want your loyalty. They want your all. Don't give it to them. Welcome to The Blessed Podcast. I'm Nancy Guthrie, author of the newly released book, Blessed, Experiencing the Promise of Revelation. The book of Revelation begins and ends with the promise, a promise to those who hear and keep what is written in it. And the promise is that those who hear and keep it will be blessed. And I don't know about you, but I want that blessing. And so that means that we need to hear what this book has to say and then live in light of it. On this podcast, I'm having conversations with people who can help us to hear it, to understand its message to us and help us to reckon with what it's going to mean for us to live in light of that message. My guest today is Tom Schreiner, who's the James Buchanan Harrison Professor of New Testament Interpretation and Associate Dean of the School of Theology at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And I'm here in his office at Southern Seminary. Dr. Schreiner, thank you for being willing to help us to hear the book of Revelation. Uh, It's great to be with you today, Nancy. I am talking with Dr. Schreiner because he is such an expert in the book of Revelation. Now, as I've arrived in his office, he's got a stack of, I don't know, how many books do you think that is, Dr. Schreiner, on your desk here? It's uh, maybe 40, maybe 40 books. (laughs) (laughs) He says he's not going to read them, you know, like cover to cover, but Mm. these are books he's using because he's actually working on yet another effort, uh, another commentary on the book of Revelation. I imagine people listening to this may be looking for resources on Revelation. So maybe they will look at this new book you've written called The Joy of Hearing, a theology of the book of Revelation, which I've read. It's not a long book, but I'm guessing by that big tall stack that maybe this next book on Revelation is going to be really a, a, a bit longer. So tell us what the difference is between these and how do both of them work to help us understand Revelation. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I also wrote uh, a shorter commentary in the ESV expository commentary. Which is so helpful for someone, especially if they're trying to teach through the book of Revelation, some concise helps on tricky things in Revelation in that expository series. Yeah, 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 that's a shorter, shorter version. It was great fun to write. And then this joy of hearing is just sort of the central themes. Yeah, not very long, maybe 55,000 words. When I read it, I wondered, so I've read Richard Balcom's Theology of Revelation. It, it's similar and different. How would you compare those to someone who might be familiar with that, with, with that book? Yeah, I mean, Richard's book is amazing. I mean, Richard himself, everything Richard does is outstanding, right? But I'd say Richard's book is probably, in terms of scholarship and technicality, just a cut above mine, you know, a, a little more challenging. So mine, mine is intended to be a, a summary that I think really any interested Bible reader could follow. And I think they could read Richard's book, but I think it, it probably Richard's book is for people who are students somewhere. Yeah. And how about this Revelation book that you're working on now? So that, that's in the Baker Exegetical Commentary of the New Testament. So I worked on Romans in that series. Now I'm doing Revelation. Yeah, it's been a great challenge, great fun. It's, yeah, it's going to be about 400,000 plus words, probably eight to 900 pages. Wow. So this so, is going to be the kind of thing someone wants to dive in deep yeah. and really understand all of this imagery and illusions and meaning in Book of Revelation. Yeah. It sounds like it'll be a great help. I hope so. Well, I pray so. <laughs> I, I, I am quite sure it will be. After all this time, I hope so. <laughs> in this new book, The Joy of Hearing, you contend that we desperately need the message of revelation in today's world. So why do you say that? One of my motivations in writing this book is to say, look, the, the book of Revelation, it's practical. It, it's, it's hard to interpret in some ways. I think ways. most people don't think about Revelation as being practical. Exactly. Why so, do you say it's practical? I was a preaching pastor for 17 years at our church, and I preached through it. And that was my motivation in preaching through it, because I said, this, this book has a message for our people today. 
And I think maybe people would sense this more than perhaps even 10 or 15 years ago. We're, we're in a battle. We're in a cosmic battle with the dragon and, and the beast. And I think the beast stands for totalitarian government. I'm not thinking of any particular political system here, but I think Christian sense, we're in a battle with, uh, with the world. We're, we're in Revelation, believers are a minority. They're a small minority in conflict in, in this world with a great opposition. And I think they're a little bit discouraged. <laughs> uh, they're, I mean, in Revelation, they're even being put to death, at least some. And so there's a temptation to compromise economically, spiritually, temptation to offer food, sacrificed idols. You'd fit in with the society, with the trade guilds. So you, you, you see that economic pressure. We don't get that specific pressure. And yet there are ways that businesses, even today, want to force some compromise uh, on us, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, you think of, you think of uh, I, I don't know his personal faith, but you think of what happened to Brandon Ike at, uh, at Mozilla. Right. I mean, he it, it came to light that he stood for the, a biblical view of marriage and uh, he lost his job. So I think Christians do face those pressures today. And, uh, and it's not going to go the other direction. <laughs> it, it doesn't unless there's a great revival. Yes. Uh, but the pressures are against us. And I think, yeah, the ordinary Christian senses in a way that I didn't sense as a child, at least. The, the, the world is opposed to us. I think that was always true, but maybe we didn't perceive it as clearly. Exactly. Well, for our conversation, I have picked seven words or phrases, and anyone who's familiar with Revelation will kind of get why maybe I would choose seven, but I've picked seven words or phrases that I think are key in the book of Revelation, and I'm hoping to just throw them out and us to talk about them. A little bit. The first one is just the idea of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the book of Revelation. In Revelation, we hear God, he, he, he's called the one who is, who was, who is to come. We hear Jesus identify himself as the Alpha and Omega. And when John sees a vision of the risen Lord Jesus in, in Revelation 1, some of the ways he is it described by John kind of sound like God the Father. And then we get to Revelation chapter four. We see God on the throne of the universes, but it's really a drama in oh. four and five because then the lamb enters the throne room and takes that scroll from God the Father. And in your book, The Joy of Hearing, you've got a whole chapter on the role of the Holy Spirit in mm -hmm. Revelation. So would you just talk to us a little bit about why in studying Revelation, we might even want to be thinking about what we're reading in terms of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? One of the things I like to say when I teach and preach on Revelation is, look, it fits with what you read in the rest of the New Testament. We don't have something really novel here. It's clothed in a different garb in the images, but it's fundamentally Trinitarian. What, what do we find out about uh, our God? Our God sits on the throne. He is the sovereign God. You know, Revelation chapter 4 is such a fascinating chapter because there, as you pointed out, we're in that throne room. We have this vision. What's, what's happening in that throne room? Well, there's, there's a massive thunderstorm taking place. It is, it, it is glorious. It is it's terrifying in that throne room. And you have these strange creatures. We won't talk about these right now unless you want to. The 24 elders, the four living creatures, the four living creatures are saying, holy, holy, holy is, uh, is the Lord. Now that goes back to Isaiah chapter 6. So, so we see a picture you know, of God in Revelation 4. Interestingly, when you see God on his throne, very much like Ezekiel chapter 1, right? He's, he's ineffable. He's indescribable. I mean, he's described in terms of, you know, these stones, jasper, emerald, the rainbow. We really don't have a direct vision of God. And I, th I think John is saying our God is transcendent. Yet, Nancy, as you pointed out, at the same time in the book, we have this tremendous emphasis on Jesus Christ as the lamb. 
And it is striking. I just challenge the hearers, if you haven't done this, go through and look at every place the Lamb and, and God are placed together, equal in stature, equal in being. Clearly, the Lamb is fully divine. Or as you pointed out in chapter one, some of those features that are used to describe the Son of Man, that's the vision in chapter one, some of those features describe Yahweh in the Old Testament. For example, if you look at Daniel chapter seven, in Daniel chapter seven, the Ancient of Days has white hair. But in Revelation chapter one, it's the Son of Man who has white hair. And John's, John's actually talking about the Son of Man, the very same chapter. That's not a mistake. You know, you might think, what, did he slip up? What, I mean, what happened here? No, he didn't slip up. He is telling us that Jesus, as the Son of Man, is fully, fully divine. And then the Holy Spirit. You know, there's not as much on the Holy Spirit in the book, but the Holy Spirit is especially the spirit of revelation. You know, those seven letters to the churches in chapters two and three, every one of those letters are the words of the Son of Man. But every one of those letters also closes with, this is the message to the churches hear what from the, the Spirit, Spirit to yeah. hear what the Spirit is saying. So God speaks through the Son of Man speaks, the Spirit speaks, the Spirit and the Son of Man, two different persons of the same divine trinity. The Spirit speaks as the Spirit of revelation, the Spirit who discloses the truth. And then uh, there's so many places the Spirit speaks in the book, key junctures in the book. John's in the Spirit in chapter 1, verse 10. He's in the Spirit in chapter 17, verse 3, when he has the vision of Babylon and then the bride, the wife of the Lamb. He's in the Spirit when he's taken up into the throne room in chapter 4. But I think one of the most interesting references is to the seven spirits in chapter 1, verse 4, because you have grace and peace from the one who is and the one who was, and the, and the one to come, which is an allusion back to Exodus chapter 3, 14. The Lord is Yahweh, I am who I am. And then you have, you have a greeting from the seven spirits, and then from Jesus Christ. But who are the seven spirits? I mean, some interpreters say they're angels, but I think that's very doubtful. First of all, the number seven is used symbolically for fullness and perfection and totality and completeness. And we have, we have to recognize, it's interesting to me, some interpreters don't even comment on this. Very good interpreters. I won't name them. <laughs> <laughs> but you have grace and peace from the one who is and the one who was and the one to come, from the seven spirits and from Jesus Christ. So I think it's very clear that the seven spirits refer to the Holy Spirit. There's not seven Holy Spirits. It's referring to the perfection of the Spirit. But what a remarkable text on the full deity of the Spirit. Grace and peace, they don't come from angels. You know, you don't read grace and peace from God and from the archangel Michael. You never read grace and peace from God and the apostle Paul. No, grace and peace only comes from God. So you have grace and peace from the Father, from the Spirit, and the Son. So that, what a remarkable Trinitarian text. What a remarkable text on the full deity of the, of the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. What I love about that passage, I think about what's about to come in Revelation, which there's a lot of challenge and hard words for the, especially the original audience of this book in terms of what they're going to need, uh, what they're going to need that grace and peace. They're going to need it for patient endurance. But it's a beautiful picture to me at the very beginning of the book that the whole of the Godhead is getting in on providing to these beleaguered believers exactly what they're going to need to overcome or to conquer, to persevere. Yeah, I think that is so true. And just two features. You know, it says Jesus is the faithful witness. That's what believers are called upon to be as well. Jesus is our exemplar. He's our, our example. Later, Antipas, who was put to death, chapter 2, verse 13, he's also called a faithful witness. Of course, Jesus is the faithful witness par excellence, but he, but, he, but he functions as the example, a call to believers. When we're called to suffer, 
he, he's gone before us. Our, our God knows. You know, Job says somewhere, uh, are, do you have flesh? Do you feel what we feel? Well, the, the New Testament answers that question because in the second person of the Trinity, God took on flesh. So that's the first thing. The second thing it says is Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. So they have great opposition. And what does he remind the readers from the beginning? In, in all your suffering and all your pain and all the difficulties you're going through, Jesus rules the kings of the earth. And, and later in the chapter, he says, I was dead, but now I'm the living one. So that's something else, right? All of us, unless Jesus comes first, we're going to die, whether probably not likely by martyrdom, but perhaps, but we will all die. But Jesus knows death, but he promises us, I'm the living one. I've conquered death. I, I, I hold the keys now of death and Hades. So great. You know, there, that's what I mean about the pastoral mm-hmm. function of this book. What great Absolutely. comfort is there. Death, death hangs as a specter, a shadow over all of our lives. But the New Testament constantly reminds us, Jesus has conquered death. And the promise in Revelation is not, I'm going to keep you from physical death or harm in this life, but you can count on resurrection life even after death, which is good news. Absolutely. All right, let's go on to another term. You mentioned this number seven, and it's interesting that in the book of Revelation, seven times we're told about a person who is blessed. Mm. I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, the book begins and end with, ends with this promise of blessing. But in the whole of the book, there are seven, what we would call Beatitudes. Most of us, when we think of Beatitudes, we think of Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount. But Revelation, we could say, has its own set of Beatitudes. In The Joy of Hearing, you say that all of these Beatitudes or blessed statements are radically eschatological. So, I, and I have a hard time saying that word, but anyway, what do you mean by that? Yeah, well, you've already pointed this out, but I just want to say no accident that there's seven, right, in the book of Revelation. So I, just, let's just think about them for a moment. He says in one three, you know, blessed is the one who reads and those who hear and those who keep, for the time is near. That's what I mean by eschatological. The time is coming. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. That's the end of life. That's, That's so different than the blessed, the way people think about it today, right? Because we think about blessing as being, you know, in the here and now, you know, I experience good things in life. So Revelation's pre- presentation of the blessed life, when it says, blessed are those who die in the Lord, it should be telling us this is very different. Yeah. Yeah. That's a shocking word really to our culture, isn't it? Um Chapter 19, blessed are those who are invited to, the, to this marriage feast of the Lamb. Well, again, that's, that's, that's coming, isn't it? Or blessed, chapter 20, blessed are those who experience the first resurrection. Of course, that's very debated what that is. We, we won't get into that right now. Blessed are those in chapter 22 who have access to the tree of life. So every one of the saints focuses on the future. The blessing, obviously God blesses us now, right? We have his presence, we have his spirit, we have the joy of uh, the church of Jesus Christ. But the greatest blessing is uh, before us. And it's easy to forget that, in, especially, I think, if we're prospering some in our re- everyday lives. We can expect this world to provide all of the blessing that we ever want and yet it always disappoints us. So Revelation, I think it just keeps maybe uh, giving it, elbowing us in the ribs saying, don't be looking for it here. The blessedness that you long for, as you say, is radically eschatological. It's, yeah. it's in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I loved it. You said earlier that you see this as a practical book because I, I, I do think it is. In fact, I studying Revelation myself, it's been profoundly challenging to me personally and to figure out what's it going to look like to live this out, to refuse to compromise, mm. to to have courage, to patiently endure. I think that's incredibly practical. So what would you say it looks like for a person to hear and keep what they read about in the book of Revelation? Yeah. So I titled my book, The Joy of Hearing. 
Because I think John is saying, be sure you don't close your ears. Don't become deaf to what's being said here. You know, these people that he's writing to, they're already Christians. But he's saying, watch out. Be sure to hear. And, but, it, but it's not enough to hear, right? We, we all know this, but reading, hearing, studying the Bible, it's not a magic vitamin pill. It, it has to be observed. James says that in, in chapter 1. And I think you touched on it. In Revelation, the temptation is especially compromise. So the, the, the church is being pressed, and so there's a temptation to compromise uh, with the world so probably for economic reasons in, in particular. And, and, and that's tied in with the call to, to endure and to the end. So one of the things John is saying very practically is hang in there. Don't forsake Jesus. Uh, stay, stay true to him. Now, of course, we can't, we can't do that on our own. We don't have the strength to do that. We, we, we need God's strength. We call upon him to help us. But those admonitions remind us, I mean, it's another way of saying, right, which we read often when we talk about the end, be alert, be vigilant. And that's not a call to know the prophecy chart. It's a call to, it's a call to be faithful uh, to the end. Well, that's related to the next uh, word or phrase that we hear over and over again, which is this call to conquer, some translations put it, other translations might put it as overcome. And then I think those two words are also related to this other repeated idea in Revelation of patient endurance. Mm. So what do you think Revelation means when it talks about conquering or overcoming? Yeah, I think, I think Revelation finally at the end of the day is saying, that who are those who don't conquer? If those who don't conquer are those who commit apostasy. So conquering isn't perfection. None of us fulfills that. But to conquer, conquering is what every true Christian does. Every true, no true Christian commits apostasy. So, I mean, I believe the Bible teaches God keeps us. But there's also a call. If we, if we believe that God keeps us and strengthens us, there's a danger of saying, well, I don't have to do anything. I can just relax. God's going to keep me. That's not the biblical picture. The biblical picture, there's always a tension in the scripture. That's the, a key word, isn't it? That there's a tension. Yeah, yeah. And you can, you can fall off on one side or the other, right? You can so emphasize, oh, we got to conquer, that you become extremely, you become nervous and uh, lack of assurance, and, and you're not trusting in God. But if you so emphasize God's promise to keep us, you can ignore these admonitions to conquer and to overcome and to be vigilant until the end. I mean, Revelation fits with all of Scripture. You know what Peter says in 1 Peter 5, the devil walks about as a roaring lion. Resist him. I think that's what Revelation is saying in conquering. Resist. Resist the dragon, resist the two beasts, resist the prostitute Babylon. They're pressing on you. They want your loyalty. They want your all. Don't give it to them. The other night we had a guest at our home and we were talking about a number of high profile Christians in our day who are doing what they would describe as deconstruction. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, perhaps sometimes deconstruction leads to a reconstruction of a, of a more biblical faith. But oftentimes, I think what we're seeing is it leads to the word you used, apostasy. I mean, because he said, what do you think about that? And I said, I think we have to use the biblical word for it, which is apostasy. It's interesting to me that, you know, people think that this is a very modern and recent thing. But actually, Revelation is speaking to it because it was a reality in their day. Maybe the particular pressures that were pressing them toward that were a little bit different, but it's an issue today. Yeah, yeah, and and I think the same person wrote First John. Yeah, you know this verse very well, Nancy. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they were of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out in order there might be plain that they all are not of us. That's what John's warning them against. Don't don't leave. Don't leave the faith. That it has uh, it has terrible consequences. God says that out of love to His people. Stay true to Jesus. 
And it is a loving message. There's a warning of what will happen if you do not uh, conquer or overcome or persevere. But what's so beautiful in so much of Revelation is also these promises of the incredible reward that will come. And it's it's a beautiful picture of motivation, isn't it? Mm. Kind of similar to Mm. to Hebrews. And I know you wrote a whole book on perseverance that focuses a lot on on Hebrews, which does the same thing. You know, it has warnings. But here in Revelation, it seems like the, the heaviness is also, especially in those letters, is... Here's the promise for the person who overcomes. Yeah. That's meant to motivate us. Those promises are amazing. And I'm I'm preaching on it this Sunday at uh, Third Avenue Baptist Church. I'm doing Revelation 21 and 22. And the the glorious new creation that uh, awaits us. So he he motivates us with the, the promises that are before us. The world that's coming, this is how I understand Revelation 21 and 22 in short. It's so beautiful that it's indescribable. It is so entrancing and delightful. Of course, what does Revelation say? We will see his face. What makes the new creation most delightful is fellowship with God himself. We will we will see God, we will see the Lamb, we'll have fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Spirit. So maybe a way we keep some of those promises that may not seem very practical, the way to that we keep them is to relish them to focus on them, to feed on them, yes. that, that that is our future. Yes. All right, uh, an image that's very prominent throughout the book of Revelation is that of a throne. And thrones, plural, uh, certainly king and kingdom is all the, way, all the way through here. We hear that the kingdom of this world is going to become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And then so a lot of these promises that are held out to us are is this idea of reigning with Christ. So just help us with that imagery throughout the book of Revelation. Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't have the exact statistics, but I think thrones is used of God like 37 times or something. Uh, I I, I wrote this down. In your book, you said the word throne appears in the singular 41 times in Revelation and 37 of those refer to the throne of God. Okay, yeah, yeah. So you think of that throne room vision in chapter four and five. Why does he use the word throne again and again? That's always a good question when we read the Bible. Why is this word so prominent? Because God rules, right? God's king. God's always in charge. God, nothing is happening, and he assures the church of this. Sometimes you wonder that today, right? What's happening in our world? God reigns. God rules. Christ rules at the right hand. And as you alluded to, we will, we're not God, we'll never be God, you know, we're not Mormons, but we will reign with Christ. There is a reign and a rule awaiting the saints, goes back to Daniel 7, the Son of Man receives the throne, and he shares that rule with the saints. So there, that's part of the reward. There are exciting tasks before us, we don't fully grasp what they are now, where we will rule with Christ in eternity, forever and ever and ever, with Christ and God over, I take it, a renewed universe. This has been challenging for me to understand, because I, like I said, to keep this, we need to relish these promises. And so I kind of scratch my head. What does that mean to reign? This has kind of helped me, and mm. tell me if you think I'm on the right track here, that part of what's being said here is we, th- we think back to Genesis 1 and 2, and how Adam was given that original instruction to exercise dominion. So is part of what's being said there uh, is, is a sense of fulfilling what God had always intended uh, with his people to rule over a, a, a worldwide kingdom filled with glorious image bearers. And that in a sense, we we have a hard time because we live in a world that's been so impacted by the curse. We have a hard time grasping what that might be like. But maybe we just have to settle into understanding this is what we were created for. When I read that, I that's the way I've begun to think of it, that we live in this world in the way that we were created for. I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think in a way, that's the storyline of the Bible, right? You've got Adam and Eve, who are to rule under God's lordship, they sin, they, and, 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 and then there's a whole plan by which that original rule 
We think of Psalm 8 too, right? What Absolutely. were human beings intended to do? To rule the world for God. Of course, that promise is finally fulfilled through the Davidic king. The fulfillment of that Davidic king is Jesus, and we'll reign with him. So yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a very full and good understanding of uh, the whole story. Yeah. All right, let's talk about judgment. I mean, we, <laughs> you, can't, you can't spend much time in Revelation without dealing with judgment. In fact, I think maybe that's one of the reasons that a lot of people avoid the book of Revelation. There are these strange images of judgment, and most of us would rather talk about God's love Mm. than to talk about God's wrath. But what seems to really stand out to me in the book of Revelation in regard to judgment is that we're shown over and over again that in heaven, so from heaven's perspective, God's perspective, and even the perspective of saints who have died and are with Christ— God's judgment is something to be celebrated. It's presented as a kind of punishment that fits the crime. So how would you summarize the main message that we should be getting from all of these passages and images of judgment in the book of Revelation? Yeah, well, I love what you said there because it's striking and perhaps a bit disconcerting when we read when Babylon is judged what are the saints and the angels doing? They're crying out, hallelujah. And, and we're, our response is, what? Well, that doesn't seem very... I thought we were supposed to love our enemies. Yeah, that doesn't seem very right. But I think, clearly, when we look at all of Scripture, we pray and long for the repentance of all who don't belong to God while we're in this life. But Revelation is looking at the end. Revelation is looking at when everything is set right. There is evil in this world. God is holy. You know, why do we struggle with judgment? Why do I struggle with judgment? Because we're very used to sin. And and we we take it for granted. And we begin to think it's not that big of a deal. But it is a big deal. God's intense, white hot holiness is such that sin deserves eternal punishment. And Revelation's very clear on that. Eternal, conscious punishment. That is something, however, if you're not a Christian, it's a call to repentance, isn't it? But finally, the saints rejoice because evil defaces and deforms and destroys the world. We we look at history. We look at contemporary events. What what does evil do? Evil evil is is destructive. We, We actually see in Revelation 17, evil implodes upon itself, right? It's, it's self-destructive even. And we can see that in individual lives. Finally, if you give yourself to evil, it'll destroy you. So, so there's a call to rejoice because what's it analogous to? It's analogous to Hitler falling, right? There was a joy when the Nazi regime fell. Virtually everyone recognized this regime is destroying human beings and life on earth. It's it's inimical to human flourishing. So too, when communism fell in 1989, there was at least most people said, this is something to rejoice over. So that's, that's what's happening. Evil has crashed. It's over. It's not just crashed. God has, God has judged it, right? So uh, that is something that we should actually look forward to and recognize at the same time, we deserve such judgment apart from the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We're not, we're not saying we're better than other people. We're not longing for people to be judged now, but we recognize the kingdom can only come when evil is removed from this world. So perhaps a way that we would hear and keep that might mean that, um, not that we celebrate judgment now, mm-hmm. but that we plead with people to Uh, become joined to Christ and thereby be protected in the judgment, but that we also find a place we can have peace in the midst of a world where there is so much evil because we have this rock solid confidence inside us based on what we have heard in the book of Revelation. And we know this is not the way it will be forever and that we know that the day is going to come when the the all-righteous judge of the earth will do what is right, 
and that when we look at what he's done, we will not think, well, I would have done that differently or I could have done that better, Mm. which is what we think now, I think. Mm. But when we have the perspective of eternity, we will say, God, you have done exactly right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And I think it's, We can say if believers are suffering under, say, a Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping or even the Uyghurs suffering under Xi Jinping, we can warn such people and even warn Christians, look, that such evil uh, will not finally triumph. You can can begin to feel, well, there's nothing we can do. This is going to last forever. No, it is not. It's... It's going to come down. So, yes, it's a call to repentance. And it's also, it's a warning to people in the world, even. Don't, don't live without reckoning with God. His, uh, his uh, judgments are slow, really. He's very patient with us, thankfully. But his judgment will come. All right. My final image in the book of Revelation I want you to talk about is that of these cities that are very prominent. I don't guess Rome is actually named in the book, but perhaps it's pictured. But the city that keeps coming up is Babylon, and which is so fascinating mm. because when we see Babylon, we realize there wasn't, you know, that's an ancient city, and yet he sees Babylon. But we've got these two pictures. We've got a picture of Babylon and the new Jerusalem that comes down to heaven. So when we get to Revelation, we've got to figure out what is being presented here in terms of Babylon, as well as what's being presented here in the terms of the idea of a, of a new Jerusalem. How do they relate to each other, and what do they mean? So talk to us a little bit about those. Yeah, I mean, Babylon really goes back to the Tower of Babel, right? Uh, you see, so you see, I think Augustine got it right. Babylon, I think it does stand for Rome, but I think it stands for the city of man generally, the city of man over against the city of God. The, the city of God is, it's very interesting. In 21.2 and 21.9, the city of God is also described as uh, the people of God, the bride, the, the wife of the lamb. And, the, and Babylon is described as the harlot, uh, the prostitute. So John's setting forth uh, the two destinies of people. So the prostitution isn't talking really fundamentally about sexual sin, but about idolatry. Who do you, who do you worship? Do you finally align yourself with the city of man, or do you align yourself with the bride, this, the city of God? Or do, do, you worship, do you worship political power, totalitarian power, self, or do you, or do you worship uh, God and, and as Christ? So those, those are the two choices. Babylon looks attractive. She's beautiful in many ways. But at the end of the day, John says there's a mystery. She's actually the mother of harlots. She's, she's actually spilling, drinking a golden cup, which is full of blood, which is disgusting, right? The world looks attractive. It looks like it'll offer something beautiful and enticing and fulfilling. But at the end of the day, it's not beautiful. But the bride, the wife of the lamb, has the white garments. So she's as beautiful as a bride on her wedding day as Paul says, without spot and wrinkle, finally. And so I think John is saying to his readers, you want to be part of that city, <laughs> that new Jerusalem that's coming, which I think we can also say that new Jerusalem represents the whole of creation. It represents the whole new universe. I think it's a physical universe, a whole new world that is coming. And John also picks up the language of Ezekiel 40 through 48, so that New Jerusalem, Greg Beale has argued this very wonderfully in a lot of places, but that, that whole new city is God's temple. The whole universe is God's temple. God, God doesn't just dwell in the most holy place. He doesn't just dwell in us as believers or as a church. Now he dwells in the whole universe. The whole universe, John uses this image as is the Holy of Holies, so to speak. Well, Dr. Schreiner, thank you so much for giving us, in a sense, the joy of hearing in this book of Revelation. We really appreciate it. It's been my delight, Nancy. This has been Blessed, a Crossway podcast hosted by Nancy Guthrie, the author of Blessed, Experiencing the Promise of the Book of Revelation. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode of Blessed. Blessed.